Shalom. Welcome back. Um, we're returning to this discussion about uh, the book of Revelation. So we're picking it up in the first chapter. Uh, I want to, again, reiterate that the information I'm getting um, in this particular study is coming primarily from this book, The Mystery is History, by Adam Drissel, and Back to the Future by Ralph E. Bass, Jr., um, before we really get into chapter one, though, I do want to make a, a note, should have included this in the, um, in the intro, but I'll put it in here. Um, and this really has to do with the parables, and I think it also, um, could be applicable to the book of Revelation, because the book of Revelation really is, it's, it's almost like a gigantic parable, um, in that, Yeshua is using symbology to represent different aspects of the fulfillment of the day of the Lord. So, Matthew 13.3, And Yeshua spoke to the crowd in parables, saying, See, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some indeed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Others fell on rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered. And others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them. And the others fell on good soil, and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So, when Yeshua is delivering these messages, these encoded messages, it's for those who have the ears to hear. Um, in fact, in this particular exchange, um, his apostles come to him and say, why do you speak to them in parables? And Yeshua says, because it has been given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever possesses, to him more shall be given, and he shall have overflowingly. But whoever does not possess, even what he possesses shall be taken away from him. <clears throat> because of this, I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Yeshayahu, it's Isaiah, is completely filled, which says, Hearing you shall hear, and by no means Understand and seeing you shall see and by no means perceive. For the heart of this people has become thickened, and their, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their heart and turn back and I heal them. Um, so I've mentioned this whole aspect of the book of Revelation before about it being fulfilled. Um, you know, when I first, when this, when this concept was first mentioned to me, I, uh, I asked the person who, who brought it up, I said, well, do you have some information on that? And they directed me to a book and I read that book and, um, I've read several books on this subject. It's kind of hard to find a, like a, a video type of presentation on it um, <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons I'm putting this video series together like if if there was a a good video series I could point to then I would just do that um, but that was my response you know it was like show me the evidence show me um, you know you know show me how I can understand this because I knew intuitively it's not something that you could just explain to someone standing on one foot so to speak you know you, it takes it takes time it's a whole lot of um, preconceived uh, no you know preconceived notions and information that you've been spoon-fed your whole life in the church about how we're looking for this coming Antichrist so I understood that I would have my own mental barriers to break down um, the response I usually get from people is, well, 
you know, like one person, one person one time was talking about people who believe that the book of Revelation has been fulfilled. And he's like, show me one example where a burning mountain was thrown into the ocean. Show, show me where a literal mountain was thrown into the ocean. And it's like, really? Like, um, you, you seriously expect a literal fulfillment of all the symbolic language in the book of Revelation. Um, and that's the thing. Like, that's the way that a lot of these futurists, that's what they're looking for. Everything's got to be very, very literal. They can't understand how any of this can be symbolic. Um, like, they're expecting a literal beast with iron teeth to rise up out of the ocean or, or whatnot. Um, and I think that's part of what it means to have eyes to see is you have to be willing to see like I I was willing to see I asked for information I wasn't there to dispute it I never heard it before um, and actually it was in response to a a video series I had done on what I thought was going to be the what was going to happen at the time of the revelation and it wasn't until this person kind of opened my eyes to it that I realized that I was wrong. So first of all, you have to be willing to have eyes to see. Um, I also kind of want to point out that I, I, somebody one time told me that um, that their Sunday school teacher told them that, you know, the, well, the reason that Jesus spoke in parables was because these people were simple farmers and, and he wanted them to be able to understand what he was saying. But that's the exact exact opposite of what Yeshua says. He says, you know, I speak to you in parables because I don't want you to understand. The only ones that could understand. See, he didn't want the crowd to understand. He wanted his apostles to understand. And you see that in the next slide I have where Yeshua um, said, you know, he said this to the crowd in parables. But he did not speak to them without a parable. So that what was spoken by the prophet might be filled, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, and shall pour forth what was hidden from the foundation of the world. Then, having sent the crowds away, Yeshua went into the house, and his taught ones, his apostles, came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the Darnell in the field. So... Someone described this as Yeshua was putting up a paywall. He, he was like, you know, if you want the insider information, you're going to have to devote yourself um, to, to you know, studying this. Like, this, this information was for the apostles. This was for, this was for his actual followers, not, <clears throat> not the crowd of people that were just kind of following him because he was a celebrity. Um... And the thing is, even where, like, there's some parables where um, Yeshua even explains it to his apostles. And even after explaining it to the apostles in, in the Gospels, we still don't get it right. Like, we, the readers of the Gospel. So earlier, I read to you the parable of the sower, where... You know, Yeshua's going out and he's he's sowing seed. And, of course, the... And he tells you what everything represents. But if I were to ask, uh, you know, just most Christians, if I were to say, hey, are you familiar with the parable of the sower? And they say yes. And I would say, okay. What was being sown? What was the seed? What did the seed represent? And they would say, oh, well, that represents the Word of God. You know, Yeshua was sowing the seed of the Word of God. and But the thing is, if you go back and read the parable, it was not the Word of God that was being sown. It was the believers that were being sown. It was you and I. That, you know, his, uh, you know, God was sowing the people into the world. So, you know, go back and read the parable. It's in Matthew 13 at the beginning, and you'll see. And, and you know, most of you are probably right now like, no, no, no. 
the 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 parable says that he was sowing the seed and the seed was the word but go back and check it and you'll see that I'm right so you know when Yeshua is given the interpretation of the parable he says and that which was sown by the in the rocky places was he who heard the word and and then he goes on and gives a description but he, he in in the in his explanation of the parable he repeatedly says that the seed is he who hears the word in this instance or he who hears the word in that instance and so where did you where did we all get this idea that the seed was the word of god well we got that from the church so you go to church and that's the interpretation they give you <clears throat> and i think that's what sticks with us instead of what yeshua said so anyway to, to understand these parables to understand the book of revelation you need to have the terminology you need to know what each component of the parable or each component of the apocalypse represents and so again i um i gave you this list of different terms in the first video and i'm just going through them quickly here you're welcome to pause it and read them if you want but i'm not going to waste time going through and rereading all these and repeating them so if if you want to see the different terms then go back you know, rewind it pause if you want to take screenshots of it or make notes or whatever you can okay so we're getting into revelation now so revelation one uh, verse one <clears throat> the revelation of yeshua messiah which elohim gave him to show his servants what has to take place with speed so there's a few things in this first sentence that I want to point out. Uh, of course, the highlighted part, the revelation of Yeshua. Um, you, you know, you hear it said, <laughs> this is John's revelation. This is the revelation of John. Um, but in the actual text, it's the revelation of Yeshua to John, not not um, not John's revelation. Um Sometimes you will see Revelation translated as apocalypse. Um, apocalypse is the word in in Greek. Apocalypse does not mean destruction or end of the world or anything like that. Like apocalypse is a revealing of something. It's this laying open. Um, and then, of course, that's what revelation means. If you get a revelation, then some secret is revealed. In fact, the word reveal is part of revelation. <clears throat> to show his servants. Now, see, this is, again, um, you know, this is part of the whole um, paywall that Yeshua put up. So if you're not his servant, <laughs> you're not going to understand the revelation. And you know, I think that's part of the problem. People don't understand the revelation because they haven't been given the insider information. <clears throat> that which is to take place with speed. Um, when he's saying with speed, it's he's saying that it's going to take place soon. Um, in fact, here at the end of this uh, selection, for the time is near. Uh, it says, and he signified it by sending his messenger to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of Elohim and the witness of Yeshua Messiah to all he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and guard what is written in it, for the time is near. So, if somebody tells you that something's going to happen and the time is near, are you expecting that to mean... Okay, well, you know, 1,900 years from now, this is going to take place. The time is near. Um, this is going to have, take place with speed. It's going to take place quickly. Um, so again, you know, this is to show his servants. It's not to conceal anything. It's to reveal. Um Revelation 1 7. See, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. And the tribes of the land shall mourn because of him. 
Now, some translations say the tribes of the world. But if you actually go into the Greek and you look at the context that's being said, it's, it's you know, the word can either mean the world or land, the land. Um, and the same is true of the Hebrew. You know, there's some, sometimes things are translated as the world when it was, it was really just speaking about the land of Israel. So this is about the tribes of the land. He is coming in the clouds and every eye shall see him even those who pierced him. So, if the ones that pierced him are seeing him, again, this has to take place in the first century. This can't be a future event. The time is near. This is going to take place quickly. Those who pierced him are going to see it. You know, This is not about some, some prophecy that's going to take place 2,000 years into the future. This is also very similar to Matthew 24 that we read yesterday. He says, And then all the tribes of the land shall mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the heavens. So, obviously, this is, you know, verse 30 here in Matthew 24 is a parallel to um, Revelation 1 7. Uh, we're going to get into speaking about the pr tribulation in a moment. Um, Notice that the timeline here in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, um, the term great tribulation it only occurs once in all of Scripture. I believe it's in the book of Matthew. Um, the other times it's, it's just referred to as tribulation. And it's not, um, you know, it's not something that's in the future. It's something that's already occurred. And we're going to see that as we progress. Um, next verse in Revelation I'm the Aleph and the Tav the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end says Yahweh who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty <clears throat> so this would essentially be the end of the paragraph so like if you look at the at the uh, Old Testament where Yahweh will declare something and he will finish this declaration he will say I am Yahweh that's kind of his certification that it's going to happen. Uh, this is the same thing here. Like He is telling John, he's telling you, the audience, that these things are going to happen. And he signs it off, he certifies it by saying, I'm the Aleph and the Tav, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Who is and who was and who was to come? The Almighty. So... This is him certifying that, that this is, you know, this is like saying, truly, truly, I say to you, this is going to happen. <clears throat> Revelation 9. John, I, John, both your brother and co-sharer in tribulation and in the reign and endurance of Yahweh, uh, Yeshua Messiah, came to be on the island that is called Patmos for the word of Elohim and for the witness of Yeshua Messiah. So, here we're back to this whole tribulation. <clears throat> See, John was in the tribulation when he wrote this. This was not, um, you know, the tribulation is not something in the future. It was taking place then, at that time. Further evidence of that is in uh, 1 Peter, where Peter says, he, he's writing his letter, he says, Peter, an emissary of Yeshua Messiah to the chosen, the strangers, and the dispersion in Pontos, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So Asia, of course, is the audience for the book of Revelation because the seven churches are in Asia that he's um, preparing to address. Drop down to verse 6, in which you exult, even though for a little while, if need be, you have been given, you have been grieved by manifold trials. You've had many trials. In order that the proving of your belief much more precious than gold that perishes and proven by fire might be found to result in praise and respect and esteem at the revelation of Yeshua Messiah. I found it interesting that Yeshua's revelation is also mentioned here. Um, first Peter goes on, uh, chapter 4, but at the end, 
but the end of all has drawn near. Therefore be sober-minded and be attentive in the prayers. Beloved ones, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that is coming upon you to try you as though some unusual matter has befallen you, but as you share in Messiah's sufferings, rejoice in order that you might rejoice exultantly at the revelation of his esteem. So, again, you know, this, this tribulation was underway. It's not something in the future. Okay, so let's go back to the book of Revelation, the first chapter. Verse 10. I, this is John speaking, I came to be in the Spirit on the day of Yahweh. So, there's different theories about what is meant by the day of Yahweh, or the day of the Lord. Um, personally, I think it is speaking about the day of Yahweh that is mentioned in the prophets in the Old Testament, where he, he speaks about the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, the day of Yahweh is about judgment coming, and it's about destruction of those that are breaking the commandments of Yahweh. This is what I think is meant by the day of the Lord. <clears throat> some some Christian theologians will say that well John had this vision on Sunday because Sunday's the day of the Lord. I don't <laughs> I, I don't think you could really get that context out of this um, out of this term here day of the Lord, like the day of the Lord, day of Yahweh, has been well established um, throughout the, the Old Testament. Um, some translations render it as the Lord's day, and that's where they get Sunday from, but um, I, I, I believe it's, it's self-explanatory what, what John is saying here. The fact that he says, in the Spirit tells you this is a vision. It tells you this is not literal. Um, this is one of those key scriptures that, that should set the stage for uh, for the understanding that this is not literal. And in the upcoming description of the appearance of Yeshua, we should know that this is not literal. <clears throat> but he says, And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Um, in the Peshitta, it says, not trumpet, it says um, shofar. So, you know, a shofar generally indicates uh, it's a call to attention. It's a call to war. Um, so, if this voice is, is the shofar blast, then it would be impending war. He's saying, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the Alpha, the Omega in the Greek. The first and the last. Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven assemblies of Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. <clears throat> Revelation 1, verse 12. And I turned to see the voice which spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band, and his head and, and hair were white as wool, um, white as snow, and his eyes as a flame of fire, and his feet like burnished brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was as the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I became dead, and see, I am living forever and ever. Amen. And I possess the keys to the grave and of death. So, to those of you who think that the book of Revelation will be literal, do you think he, do you think that this is the literal appearance, the literal, uh, if you were to, you know, you're walking down the street and you run into Yeshua, would it be somebody walking around with a with a sharp sword sticking out of his mouth and you know his face glowing like the sun, or is this symbolic? 
and it should be obviously symbolic. Um, so what does this all mean? Well, the, you know, his face is the sun is about kingship. Um, the, the white hair, the burnished brass that's been through the furnace, like this is all about holiness. So it's emphasizing, um, his obvious, you know, holiness, his eyes as a flame of fire. That's, you know, impending war again. Um, but it's about it's about holiness and it's about impending judgment. That's what this appearance is supposed to, to be. And that's the symbology of it. This essentially brings us to the end of the first chapter. Um, he does go on to say, uh, To John, write therefore what you have seen, both what is now and what shall take place after these. The secret of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars of the messengers of the seven assemblies, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven assemblies. And then that brings us to the end of the chapter. Um, so, you know, like I said, this is really just setting the stage. This is letting you know that that this is a vision. He's in the spirit. And, um, and so we're going to pick up with uh, chapter 2 where we get into the uh, the messages being sent to the assemblies. So thank you for listening and shalom.